very much, Stava. Um, I just first of all want to try and kind of give a, a, a brief description of the phases of the development of the, uh, the Arab Revolution and the uh, attempts by the imperial powers to intervene in it. And I think um, it, it's one thing that we, we shouldn't forget, um, that the Tunisian and, uh, and Egyptian revolutions took the imperial powers by surprise. They didn't foresee it and they didn't know immediately how to react how to react to it. Uh, um, has referred uh, to the, uh, well, the only, let's put it this way, the only uh, Western um, minister so far uh, to lose their job directly as a result of the Arab revolutions is the French foreign minister, and she lost her job because she didn't realize quickly enough that you weren't going to stick by all the old dictators in quite the old, uh, in quite the old way. So the immediate phase of the, of the popular rebellions uh, massively discomforted uh, the, the imperial powers, and it's a threat to the imperial architecture of the entire of the entire regime. And and by extension, if the revolutions continue and deepen, not only for the imperial architecture of the uh, of, of the region, but to the economic interests of the major powers in the region, as well as to the economic interests of the local of the local ruling classes. So there couldn't be a more profound uh, eruption into the status quo of the world system than a popular series of revolutions in this part uh, in, in this part of the world. The only imaginable rate of threat would be there were a series of linked uh, revolutions in the uh, in the heartlands of the imperial system uh, of the imperial system itself. So this was always going to be a world historic series of uh, series of events, and that was the opening. Of them, the second decisive phase came with the um, uh, with the simultaneous uh, and not coincidental uh, intervention, uh, military intervention by the imperial powers in Libya and in Bahrain, and they were simultaneous and they were coordinated and they are part of the same process because there was a great deal at stake, Jeremy, in the previous session, I think Fiona mentioned it in her, in her speech today, there are of course internal uh, economic interests at stake in Libya, in, in Libya itself, and those, are, and those are important, but they pale into insignificance compared to the general uh, uh, interests at stake in the entire region and to the general threat which the, which the revolutions pose uh, opposed to the imperial interests of the region. Uh, oil profits are one thing that's important to imperialism, but the profits of every corporation operating in the region, the stability of the entire imperial setup, their ability to intervene in this geopolitically central part of the world are even greater than that, and it was an intervention designed to draw a line under the spreading of the, uh, of the Arab revolutions, using the sympathy which many, many millions of people rightly have for the Arab revolutions, including the beginning of the revolution in Libya, as a way of being able to re-establish the, um, uh, the logic, the argument of humanitarian intervention, so discredited by the failures in Afghanistan and Iraq, to rehabilitate this as an ideology of warfare in the Libyan, uh, in the, in, in the Libyan case, and to combine it with a simple brutal crackdown uh, led by the Saudis of the Bahrainian Revolution in the way that uh, in the way that has been uh, has been described, and I think that that now marks a more complex phase of the revolution because now we have to distinguish between those elements on the ground which are willing to accommodate to Western intervention, which for whatever, uh, however, in their terms, understandable reasons, but are going to uh, allow the imperialists a foothold in the course of the Arab revolutions, and that won't be simply where they militarily intervene. It won't be limited to Libya or to Bahrain. It is a threat to the entire revolutionary process, both in the uh, partially accomplished revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, and to the spread uh, in Yemen or anywhere else in the, uh, in, in the Arab world. And therefore, um, the only possible conclusion from this combination of events, in my view, is to continue to support those revolutions which are fighting both their domestic ruling classes, their domestic 
uh, dictators and the imperial system, but to simultaneously uh, insist that the greatest possibility of victory for those revolutions is if we simultaneously combine that support with an absolute refusal that the imperial powers have anything to offer, anything to do, or any right to intervene in this, uh, in this uh, process. That is the way in which we buy the greatest possible freedom for the Arab revolutions to develop on their own terms and by their own internal, internal dynamics. Um, I would say there is one final phase, one final development, which is as important in this continuing uh, sequence of events as the original eruption and the uh, intervention of the imperial powers, and that is the way in which the Arab Spring has erupted into the logic of Palestinian uh, of Palestinian politics. I think it's impossible to imagine that you would have the uh, hamas fatah unity deal without the transformation of Egyptian foreign policy, even under the military government, by the way, under the impact of the, uh, of the uh, uprising in, in, uh, in Egypt, and also without the inspiration which the 15th of March uh, um, movement demonstrations of Palestinians themselves demanding a change in the attitude of their own political leadership, but primarily of demanding demand, uh, uh, direct elections to the, the Palestine National Council, uh, that that has had on the, Palestinian, uh, on the Palestinian leadership. And I think that that is an important development because I think it's created for the imperial powers even after the intervention in Libya and after the intervention in Bahrain, um, a additional uh, obstacle to them getting their own way in the Middle East. The fact that Palestinian uh, resistance has now taken on a, 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 a more unified form. There are problems with the unity. There are problems about the way in which this may pan out. There's a problem with the refurbishment of the two-state solution, which is being canvassed on the back of, of this unity. All that's true, but nevertheless, you're seeing a rebirth of the Palestinian question at the forefront of, of, uh, of international politics, and any strengthening of the Palestinian cause, with whatever qualifications, is a further obstacle uh, to imperialism. So we, we see now an entire, uh, an entire front, or really a, a sort of line of battle, which is composed on their side of American, British, and French imperialism uh, primarily, uh, allied, of course, uh, to the Israeli state and the Saudi state, always the main uh, pillars of Western influence in the, in, the, in the Middle East, and concluding on their side, on the counter-revolutionary front, with the existing governments that want to end the revolutionary process where it is, in, uh, in, in Tunisia uh, and, uh, uh, and Egypt. And on our side, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the cornerstones of this still, the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution, plus the anti-imperialist movement and the anti-war movement internationally, plus the rebirth of the Palestinian struggle and solidarity with that internationally. That, I would say, is the main lines of, uh, of, of battle. Um, and uh, as I say, that, that gives us um, two clear and immediate tasks of solidarity with the Arab uh, Revolution, solidarity with the Palestinian movement, and uh, for us, critically, because we are in the heartland of the imperial system, opposition to our own government's attempts to intervene and draw a line under the spread of the Arab Revolution. Every uh, demonstration, every protest, every limitation we uh, can impose on our own government's ability to intervene is time bought for the development of the uh, of the uh, of the Arab uh, Revolution. I want to conclude a little bit by saying something specifically about the Egyptian Revolution, because the Egyptian Revolution is still the central uh, revolution of, uh, of, of this region, which is no disrespect to the, the people fighting in, 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 in Tunisia or in any other part of the Arab world. But the Egyptian uh, revolution uh, is central uh, for the following reasons. It is the largest and most influential country in the Middle East. It is the largest working class movement in the, uh, the Middle East. It has the longest uh, prehistory of uh, systematic opposition uh, to its dictator, and it is at the moment, the, in my view, the deepest going uh, revolutionary, uh, revolutionary process. And you can see the impact of Egyptian politics, as I say, on the Palestinian questions and on many other questions. We don't have time to go into the question of relations with Iran, but it's there, it's there in that context, it's there in that context as well. And so long 
as the momentum of the Egyptian revolution is not broken, the process of the Arab revolutions as a whole is not broken either. And I just want to say a few words about where we are. You see, Mubarak gone, you have military government which is attempting to, uh, to freeze the revolutionary process where it exists and to organize a transition to a capitalist, a stable, they hope, uh, pro-capitalist, uh, pro-Western uh, democracy in, in Egypt. Their timetable, the military government's timetable, is this. Constitutional referendum, which they've already had, making the most marginal changes uh, imaginable to the old Mubarak constitution, followed by uh, parliamentary elections, possibly in September, followed by a presidential election, and then that's it. That is all the democracy you're going to get. And that timetable of electoral transformation is combined with a systematic attempt to demobilize the actual democratic movement as it exists on the ground. So there are physical attacks on demonstrators in Tahir Square. There are physical attacks on the women's demonstration on the 8th of March. There are physical attacks and attempts to generate on Coptic Christians and attempts to generate conflict between Copts and Muslims. There is a law being passed although not yet um, by any means able to be fully acted upon, which makes it an, an offensive, prisonable by a year in jail and a million uh, 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 Egyptian pound fine for organizing a demonstration or organizing uh, a strike. In other words, a systematic attempt to demobilize the Republic of Tahir, which made the, the revolution in the first place. Opposed to that, is an enormous strike wave which began in the, set in the two days before Mubarak fell. It was one of the elements that was critical in bringing down, uh, bringing down Mubarak and has continued since. The enormous unionization drive, an enormous level of strike activity. Also involved in this has been the formation of popular committees. I was in Cairo last weekend with Fiona and, uh, and, and, and others. Uh, I, I, I conducted an interview, actually an amazing interview, because I think very little of this is publicised in the West with somebody who is studying um, the popular committees as they've been formed in, in Baba, which is one of the poor working class areas of, uh, of Cairo. I mean, Cairo, to, to, to sort of understand, one of the things about understanding the Egyptian revolution is to understand the, the kind of class geography of Cairo. Cairo is an inside-out city. If you think about London, uh, what happens in, in London is basically the rich colonise the centre and they push the working class out to Dagenham or wherever. Um, but that isn't true in Cairo. The rich live in the outer suburbs, in, uh, in Mahdi or in uh, Heliopolis, right out by the airport, and some of the poorest areas of the city are nearest its centre. And so the demonstration in Tahir were, some people assembled immediately, but many of them were marches that came from Ibaba and other popular areas into, into Tahir Square. And uh, the first one I was talking to said there was, he went, he was there. A popular committee met in the street, organised a, a, a meeting in the street in Zimbabwe of two or three hundred people who are still drawing up their demands of what they expect uh, from the revolution to take the next demonstration in, in Tahir. And he said, this is one of ten such popular committees just in the area of Zimbabwe. So there is still, hidden from view, not reported, but a popular momentum in the Egyptian revolution and it stops the military government from fully conducting a counter-revolution in the way that it wants to do. So there's a constant process of, uh, of pull and push, of a, a tug of war. And each time the military government tries to do this, there are rather like the journée, the great days of popular mobilisation in the French Revolution, days in Tahir Square, which on Nakba Day, for instance, or a, a week last Friday, uh, a mobilisation without, for the first time, the participation of the Muslim Brotherhood, indeed against uh, the advice of the Muslim Brotherhood, in order to stop the military regime making any further progress. So my point is this. Um, the Egyptian revolution is a ball still in play. And in my view, it won't be finished until either they successfully crush the popular movement or the popular movement raises the question that there can be no completion of this revolution until not only are the democratic demands of the revolution fully met, but also the demands that people in Zimbabwe for the, for the social transformation of their area, the social needs of their area, until those are met. Or to put it bluntly, in a society where, and Egypt is such a society, where two, where 
um, half the population earns less than two dollars a day, there is no complete revolution until those people feel that their lives have been transformed, that they are in control of the revolution, that they are actually shaping uh, the, 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 the spending of the wealth the creating, that they created in order to transform Egyptian society.